Heather Hurlbert, and I'm delighted to welcome you to New America this afternoon um, on behalf of our political reform program and our fellows program. Um, New America, as you know, is all about renewing America for the digital age, and we also like to say that we're a national network, which means that we're a think tank in D.C., but not necessarily of D.C., and today is one of those days where we make good on that promise by pulling in folks who are working all over the country to start with the perspective of an issue, um, immigration, that we tend to think about primarily in its federal guise. But as you're going to learn, there is an amazing range of experimentation, activity, policymaking going on at the at the federal, at the state level, if um, if the states are the the, the laboratories of democracy, um, folks are working at midnight in the lab, um, as we're about to learn. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank first our Arizona State University fellow, um, Jude Jaffe Block, um, at whose instigation this event is happening. Um, Jude has the, she's um, coming to the end, sadly, of her of her time with us, where she has been. Um, co-authoring a book about immigration enforcement in Arizona's Maricopa County, which will detail uh, the famous Sheriff Joe Arpaio's crackdown on illegal immigration and the class action racial, racial profiling suit that was brought against him. You'll hear a little bit today about um, the broader universe of immigration-related policy uh, surrounding that and what implications that's had, had for other states. Uh, for the last five years, Jude has worked as a public radio reporter in Phoenix covering immigration and border, among other issues for, for regional and national audiences. Um, joining us today to, to help us make broader sense of the immigration issues, we have um, Adam Hunter, who is an immigration policy and strategy consultant who has held leadership roles on national and homeland security issues and migration and immigration policy and research. He directed the Pew Charitable Trust's Immigration and the States Project, looking at the intersection of um, national, state, and local policies. Before joining Pew, Adam was acting chief of staff at the US Citizenship and Immigration Services at the Department of Homeland Security, um, which has the job of administering immigration benefits. Um, he has been both a Truman National Security Fellow and a Transatlantic Forum on Migration Fellow. So we're, we're very glad to, to welcome Adam. Um, we're also happy to have Ali Nurani, who is the Executive Director of the National Immigration Forum, an advocacy organization which promotes the value of immigrants and immigration. Um, before joining the National Immigration Forum, he was Executive Director of the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition. Um, he's also held leadership roles in public health and environmental organizations, so is able to, to think about how immigration reflects um, and connects to those issues. He's the author of There Goes the Neighborhood, How Communities Overcome Prejudice and Meet the Challenge of American Immigration, and he spent recent years traveling the U.S., um, having conversations and learning about how immigration, the issue, plays out in um, communities and in the everyday lives of Americans. So we're, we're very happy to welcome Ali to, to talk about his book and what he learned in the process of writing it. And last but certainly not least, we are delighted to welcome Michael Frank, um, our neighbor in the Hoover Institution and where he directs its DC programs. Prior to joining Hoover, he served as policy director and counsel for House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Um, Michael, I was teasing him that he's a serial offender on the Hill. He also served as communications director for former House Majority Leader Dick Armey. And in between his time on the Hill, he served as Vice President for Government Relations at the Heritage Foundation and worked in the U.S. Department of Education and the Office of National Drug Control Policy. So um, you are in for a real treat this afternoon as we're going to get some initial thoughts from each of our panelists about um, how immigration has been playing out in their particular area of expertise. We'll then um, have some conversation among the panelists. I always say I like to provoke a little pleasant disagreement. We'll then um, have time for questions for all of you. And then um, at the end, we do urge you to stick around because there'll be some light refreshments and some time to get to know each other and your fellow panelists at, at the end of our, of our session today. So with that, um, Adam, I want to invite you to kick it off and to talk a little bit about sort of the comprehensive overview you have of what's, what's going on in the states on this supposedly most frozen of issues, immigration. Thank 
you very much, Heather, and thank you all for being here on a beautiful, beautiful Monday evening in Washington. And to all those at home, I hope you're watching on a balcony because it is glorious weather outside. <laughs> Um, so thanks, Heather. I wanted to start with a couple of the broader trends that I've seen um, over the course of working at the federal level and then focusing on state and local issues over the past couple of years that really animate this federalism dynamic that we have in the United States. So of course, federalism issues go back to the founding, right? Anyone who's seen Hamilton knows that there's been a lot of interplay and discussion around these issues. But as it re relates a little bit more closely to immigration, there's a couple things I wanted to highlight. So we understand the federal government has exclusive control over who is legally admitted and who is removed from the country, but does very little in terms of how people are integrated and what support mechanisms are provided that are really place-based and left to other levels of government, other sectors of society there, frankly. Uh, we've also seen since 1990 more than doubling of the number of immigrants in our country. We have about 43 million immigrants or foreign-born individuals now uh, more than doubling since 1990 alone. So a drastic increase in the number of newcomers who have come to the United States. We've also seen over recent years, um, more than ever in our history, in fact, um, an increased disbursement of these new immigrants. So immigrants are not just settling in the big six gateway states of New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Florida, Texas, and California, but they're going to new gateway states, they're going increasingly to suburbs and outside of city centers. And in some research I did in my last role, we looked at the counties uh, as a unit of analysis between 1990 and 2012. And the share of immigrants grew in 87% of all US counties nationwide, but their impact was really outsized in some particular areas. And there were 22% of American counties in which the native born, the US born population declined over that period. But in more than half of those, it was the growth of immigrants that mitigated those losses. And in fact, in many of those counties actually overcame the loss of natives so that the counties grew solely because of immigrants. And if you were to look at that graphically, you see swaths from the Texas panhandle on up to Minnesota, really the middle of the country that are acutely affected by this population change over about the past 20, 25 years. Um, we've also had at the federal level, and speaking of the federal government kind of executive and legislative branches here, a lack of structural reforms and really systemic reforms of our immigration system in more than 20 years. We've set some programs and some increasing numbers of immigrants in 1990. We've rejiggered some enforcement uh, regimes and uh, instituted some bars to readmission and some other programs in 1996. But there's arguably not a big overhaul of our immigration system now in 21 years. So it no longer meets the realities of our economy, of our aspirations, of our expectations of ourselves and of newcomers than when these laws were written. Um, so with all of that as backdrop, there's a couple things that I've seen with regard to how the federal government engages with states and to a degree localities as well. And that is um, federal action, of course, influences state and local action. Um, but there's also evidence that state and local action may well determine whether the federal policy aims are fulfilled. Uh, we've seen this going way back through 1986, IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Con excuse me, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, where Congress provided money and authorities for states to administer programs on behalf of the federal government. More recently, in 2012, the president's uh, President Obama, one of his executive actions, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. There was no funding to states, but we see through research that the places where local governments, where state governments provided the outreach and bully pulpit, provided public funding and engaged organizations had a higher uptick and success of participants in enrolling in the DACA program. Um, we've seen the countervailing trend when President Obama in 2014 tried to enact the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans program for the uh, unauthorized immigrant parents of permanent residents and US citizens, that it was states that sprung to action uh, and litigated that and blocked implementation of that program. And of course, we see through enforcement, um, similarly during the Obama years, it was state and local activity challenging ICE that forced changes in what was then secure communities to institute the priority enforcement program, a regime which has now been dismantled um, under the Trump administration, but we see now a whole litany of discussion around uh, what ought to be proper enforcement and dividing of duties between federal, state, and local authorities. 
So the second bucket is that, interestingly, states have also been using policy tools at their level of jurisdiction increasingly to affect their desired immigration outcomes. And these not need be intentionally or inherently immigration related. Think of higher education and the issue of in-state tuition, licensing and credentialing for foreign born workers or even unauthorized immigrants, or extending some kind of um, official identification. Um, IDNYC, New York City has a, a municipal identification program. Driver's licenses in 12 states in the District of Columbia, including California, where they had more than 600,000 enrolled in the first year. Um, so as a result of all of those trends, we see now that there are states um, that are really pushing the boundaries of what uh, the daily life can really be like for an immigrant, and particularly an unauthorized immigrant in their jurisdiction, and that the experience of an immigrant varies greatly depending on where one is. The extreme example here is California, where, for example, as an unauthorized immigrant can get a driver's license, be admitted to um, a California university at in-state tuition, get financial support. They're protected from what's called the Trust Act, so statewide bar on honoring ICE detainers in California. They can graduate and get an occupational license using a, a taxpayer identification number to get a certified state credential for plumbing, engineering, interior design. Uh, and there's actually now legislative proposals that would provide health care for all and would expressly cover unauthorized immigrants in a single payer health system that is under the legislature for consideration in this term. Um, so for a lot of you know, different reasons we can get into, California is really leading and in, in terms of an example of trying to reduce the unauthorized status in this case to be as meaningless as possible for daily interactions for their jurisdiction. So one key example of how states are leading the way. Great. Thanks for, for starting us off there. And um, as we were going to sort of move directly from California to its opposite, um, Jude, you have put five years of your life into learning um, and, and telling the story of the Arizona example, and not just the Arizona example, but what it meant in the past and means now in other states. Right. Well, I, I thought I'd just start by kind of trying to give you a little overview of what happened in Arizona. Um, probably many of you have heard of SB 1070 in 2010, which is Arizona's most famous immigration law, but it certainly, it wasn't actually the first one. So the, the wave of, of Immigration Enforcement Administration began e well before that, in the early mid-2000s. And some people could argue it started even before that, but for our purposes today, uh, what you end up with is are several laws passed by the state legislature as well as by voters um, through ballot initiatives um, aimed at um, this goal of, of assisting the federal government with immigration enforcement. Um, a lot of the, the Republican st state lawmakers who advance these bills believe that the state should have the right to also enforce immigration law along with the federal government as a partner. And they very much would like to see that continue even today under the Trump administration, which is taking you know, a, a similar view on the immigration question. Um, but I, I really like the list that Adam gave of California because all of the things Adam named are things that are the opposite in Arizona. So no driver's licenses for unauthorized immigrants. There was a big fight over whether um, DACA recipients could get licenses that they ultimately won, but at first they were banned. Um, there, um, I think you mentioned something about workers being able to have some kind of credential to be able to work. So Arizona passed a law that said, uh, um, that criminalized uh, working with a fake ID, which is the main way that unauthorized immigrants work. Um, so that became a state felony and something that state law enforcement could prosecute. Um, I think you mentioned health, some health care benefits. There, there was actually a state proposition that um, made sure that uh, if any immigrant applying for state benefits, that uh, the, the government agency should check their status and report their status if they found out they were unauthorized. Um, there, the California has the Trust Act to limit cooperation between uh, the federal government and some local law enforcement, or allow local law enforcement to not detain uh, certain unauthorized immigrants who have been accused of certain crimes, who are in jail, and not hold them. Um, Arizona, SB 1070, included a provision that, uh, that, set, that bans sanctuary cities, that 
says you can't be a sanctuary city. So, which is, of course, a super hot topic right now with the Trump administration and with Texas's SB4. Um, so I just think that's a really nice parallel, right? These next door neighbors having really different um, structures. But I mean, so I just gave you a litany of, of laws and there are actually more and I could go on and on and I'm happy to answer that in a Q&A, but um, in the interest of time, I won't tell you all of the things Arizona passed, but just to paint a picture with the state level laws that were passed and the ballot initiatives, plus Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who took it very seriously to be uh, very strict on immigration, um, and the federal 287G task force program, which was a partnership between the federal government and local law enforcement agencies that, that deputized police on the street through the task force program to enforce federal immigration laws. All of these programs together, which, which you had in Maricopa County for, for a two year period between 2007 and 2009, the combination of Arpaio, state laws, um, and the 287G program that gave his deputies federal power meant that in places like Maricopa County, if you were an unauthorized immigrant, your life could change very quickly one day to the next. So you could get in your car and a broken taillight could lead to deportation because there were these very aggressive neighborhood sweeps with deputies who had immigration authority. You're stopped for a traffic violation your question about immigration, you end up in deportation proceedings. Or you go to work and your workplace is the, is, um, has been targeted by one of our PIO's worksite raids because you've worked with a fake ID, that's a felony, now you're in jail um, on, on state charges. Another Arizona law says that you are ineligible for bond. So now you're in jail until your trial, you're probably gonna plead guilty, now you have a felony, now you're a priority for deportation, now you're in deportation proceedings. So what we saw was sort of a very widening of the net of um, a lot of these programs. Uh, the intent of 287G was to be a force multiplier um, to allow local, uh, local police to aid federal, federal agents um, in immigration enforcement. But also with all of these other state laws and, and local actors like Sheriff Arpaio, you get this it becomes a lot easier to wind up in deportation proceedings and the net of people who, who are getting into it is, is broader and broader. And so I think, so there are a lot of um, uh, law professors and, and others sort of looking at Arizona's, the case of Arizona with what could, could this be the same climate that could happen under the Trump administration? And you know, we know that, that there are people who were very much at the center of Arizona's immigration enforcement policy who were instrumental in the Trump campaign, you know, um, our former governor, Jan Brewer, and former sheriff, um, Joe Arpaio, were both very important surrogates. Trump's immigration speech was in Phoenix. Um, Chris Kobach, who, who authored SB 1070, um, is now in the Trump administration under the new Election Integrity Commission. So there are these linkages. So, I mean, there, and 287G, the program that I mentioned, is something that we've seen the Trump administration signal that they would like to continue. So I think there's reason to believe that, that sort of the Arizona case could, could be relevant uh, to the national picture. So I just wanna take another second to talk about, you know, what, what are the lessons learned from Arizona's um, sort of experiment with state-based immigration enforcement and um, I think it really depends who you ask, and I, I just want to be very careful that there's a there's a, a wide array of views on this. And so I did talk with um, the state senator who introduced the bill, Russell Pierce, recently about its legacy, and he feels like SB 1070 uh, was a huge success, and it really reduced the unauthorized population in Arizona. There was a big exodus of people who went to other states. Um, some of the people who were originally from Mexico returned to Mexico. Um, he believes that it, it is the reason why crime rates went down. Others think that there is not a cause and effect relationship. Um, then you talk to the law enforcement community and there's kind of a mixed bag. Certainly some sheriffs like Arpaio and others um, were big fans of the bill and had wanted stricter immigration enforcement. Um, others felt like it complicated, um, others in law enforcement felt like it complicated the job of their deputies. Um, again, sorry, in, <laughs> in that litany of, of rules that I gave you, I, you know, SB 1070 had something that 
said that, that uh, local police should inquire about immigration status. This was the sort of famous show me your papers part of the, of the law. Um, so there, there's been you know, contention about whether that degraded the trust with the immigrant community and local police. And I think there was a really interesting instance that happened um, uh, this past year. There's a, a part of Phoenix that's heavily Latino where there was a serial shooter. Um, and the, the police were really asking for community involvement. They were saying, we need you to help us solve this crime. We need to hear from the community. And, and there were several victims in a row, and, some, and not everyone, not all of them were fatal shootings. Um, and so they said, you know, who has seen this guy? We, we need help. And there were a group of immigrant women who had formed a neighborhood watch in this heavily immigrant Latino area. And they said, they told the press, we're really having trouble. People are telling us that SB 1070, um, the things that our PIO used to do um, here are, are really diminishing our trust. We can't convince anyone to cooperate. They're too afraid. So we did see a very real example. I mean, this always gets highlighted as a concern from some police chiefs. But there was a, an actual case where we saw it play out in Arizona. Um, and um, the other effect is, you know, we saw the business community come out and say, you know, that there, there had been some ramifications on the economy in the state. There had been conventions and tourism dollars lost after there was a, a boycott because of SB 1070. I think we're starting to see, you know, is, is SB 4 in Texas going to replicate? And, you know, that's a big question. You know, we saw that kind of boycott in North Carolina. I have questions. How often are you know, other states going to boycott other states. You know, I, I don't know how sustainable it is to keep going. You know, I, I think there's real questions like whether this, this tool will lose its effect at some point. But in Arizona, there are certainly some who felt like it made a difference. And, and ultimately, um, after 2010, after SB 1070, the legislature didn't pass any more extreme immigration laws. There were a couple, but they weren't, they didn't kind of rise to that level. Um, and then, um, Finally, I would say that the, on the grassroots side of things, there was a kind of a group of activists who were galvanized because of, um, because of the, the enforcement threat who started organizing on the ground. Some of those activists have become recruited in other states to train people about how to block deportations, how to teach the immigrant community know your rights. So some of those, that Arizona knowledge is now being exported. Um, and there were also lawsuits that were really successful um, for the most part. So a lot of the apparatus that I described, um, well, some, it's such a patchwork. There, a lot of the things that got passed in the mid-2000s ended up getting scaled back or struck down by federal courts. Some things are still in effect, but other things got struck down. If you want to know more about that, I'm happy in the Q&A to go over it so I don't bore everyone um, with the ins and outs. But, but there was quite a bit of litigation. It took years and years, but, but, um, but there were real changes because of federal court intervention, which I think kind of gets lost. It's, it's not a very sexy story, um, but, it, but it is an important piece of what happened here. And I think, you know, moving forward, what pieces of this um, could, could we see on a national scale? I, mean, I think it's important to note that, that we're seeing uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions talking about um, the criminal consequences, um, how federal prosecutors, he's encouraging federal prosecutors to prosecute immigration-related offenses, which it can often, you know, there could be, if somebody's in the country unlawfully, there's a question, should they go through deportation proceedings, or should they also be criminally prosecuted for certain offenses, like illegal reentry, or human smuggling-related crimes, or ID theft. And so, you know, I think that some of the, the ways in which uh, Arizona kind of demonstrated that there could be a kind of a state level criminal apparatus on top of um, deportation, we could start seeing more of that um, under the federal regime. Um, and so I'll, I guess I'll, and I, I guess as a very final point, you know, I just want to raise with the, the opposites with California, you know, I think we could also see the Department of Justice, of course, during the Arizona's heyday had sued over SB 1070. You know, are we going to see sort of a flip where now California and other states that want to do more to protect or extend benefits to, to unauthorized immigrants, are they going to, is it going to reverse course where now they're going to be kind of opposite with the Trump administration? So I just think that's sort of an interesting trading places that 
Arizona and California are seeing. Thanks. Um, Ali, you've spent a lot of time in recent years in states that aren't Arizona and aren't California, and that maybe we could describe as not wanting to be either of those. Yep. Um, and that you went out on the road with the idea that there was another way to, to get at these issues. And tell us about sure. what you found. So um, the National Immigration Forum in 2010, we decided that we wanted to do something completely different. And the book that I wrote starts on this particular day, uh, December 18th, 2010, where on December 18th, two things happened in the United States Senate. One was that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, and the second is that the DREAM Act was defeated. And you know, on that day, I remember telling a colleague, we're going to do things differently next time. So looking backwards from December 18, 2010, I realized that the, don't ask, the community that was advocating for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they ran a policy campaign based on culture and values. They, they engaged the military establishment. They made the case, the case to the American public of what it means to be able to serve your country openly and freely. Those of us in the immigrant rights community, we ran a campaign based on politics. We focused on the idea of you know, making sure the Latino voters were naturalizing, that folks were registering to vote. And in 2010, we focused on the swing states of Nevada and Colorado. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. The DREAM Act was defeated. Uh, and what we did is we looked at the map and we said, OK, if the, least, you know, if the states in the southeast, the Midwest, and the Mountain West have the least amount of support for what could be argued as the most compelling piece of immigration policy, the DREAM Act, how do we move those votes? There are not enough you know, Latino, Asian, New American voters to run a political strategy. You know, some people will say, well, demographics is destiny. Well, no, it ain't. Um, it may be in California, maybe in Arizona, maybe in some states, but it's certainly not in the Midwest, um, and certainly not in the, the Southeast for the foreseeable future. So we first looked at the faith community. The highest number of adults who identify as evangelical Christian are in the Southeast, the Midwest, and the Mountain West. And we looked at law enforcement. Highest density of state and local law enforcement are those same three regions. And to get at your question, or your, the data point that you, you raised, the fastest growth in the foreign-born population is those same three regions. So we embarked on a strategy that engaged the faith, law enforcement, and the business community, the conservative faith, law enforcement, and business community, in a conversation of what it means for these, these sets of leadership to engage in the immigration debate. Um, and you know, I'm happy to, to kind of go into the different angles. Um, but that, that strategy, we, we you know, started to move forward on 2011 with, in 2011 and really have carried it forward uh, to this day. Um, last spring, I, um, you know, kind of based on the, this idea, I, I spent a couple of months, two and a half, three months, going to, you know, talking to national leaders from these communities, but also spending time in South Carolina, suburban Houston, uh, Utah and Indiana to, uh, to kind of do a deeper case, case studies. And what I found in each of these, and I, over the course of about three months, I interviewed, I think, almost 60 faith, law enforcement, business leaders uh, from these areas plus you know, other, other parts of the country. I um, also spent some time in uh, rural eastern Washington. I always forget about that one. Nobody hears from eastern Washington, right? OK, I'm safe. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and then over the summer and into the fall, I, I wrote it. So I wrote the book right when we were in the middle of the presidential campaign. Uh, so a lot of people ask me, well, did you have to change anything after the election? Uh, because that's when we were doing final edits. And I'm not entirely sure how to feel about, about this answer yet, but no, we didn't have to, I didn't have to change anything. I had to change you know, a few things here and there, but by and large, I think the, cha the challenge remains the same in terms of how do you, and this is the thesis that I try to advance in the book, is that the immigration debate is not about politics and policy for the overwhelming majority of Americans in the country. It is about culture and values. When an immigrant moves into a community in South Carolina, they're asking the question of, you know, native-born South Carolinians are asking the question, is my culture going to change? Are my values going to have to change? Is my, how much is my neighborhood going to change? Um, so the book tells a story, a series of stories of how, from these different perspectives, how people are managing and, and engaging in this change in a really honest and authentic way. Doesn't, it's not easy by any means. So I guess the, you know, I can you know, provide a, a ton of different examples, but the one that I wanted to lift up, uh, kind of relevant to, to what Jude and Andrew are saying, were um, in South Carolina. Last year, so, so one thing about South Carolina. South Carolina has seen the fastest growth 
in the Hispanic population second only to North Carolina. So the way I wrote it is that um, it felt like as the textile mills were moving to Mexico, Mexico was moving to South Carolina. Um, one of the things that happened spring of last year was that there, just as the presidential campaigns were heating up, the Syrian refugee debate was heating up, World Relief, one of the, the nation's leading refugee resettlement organizations, was looking to start an office, open an office in Spartanburg, upstate South Carolina. And um, turned into this huge uh, uh, debate in the state, in the community. And the state legislature decided to move forward with legislation that would have required uh, refugee resettling in South Carolina to register for the state, with the state. And second, would have held liable the organization that resettled the individual for any crimes the individual may, have, may commit in the future. So in essence, it would have halted refugee resettlement to the state of South Carolina. Realizing that there was not a political strategy to, change, to, to move the needle. Our, our organizer in uh, um, Alabama, his, his ter part of his territory is South Carolina, is a Southern Baptist pastor. He went to, he you know, already knew people in South Carolina, started spending more and more time there. Built out a coalition that included the Southern Baptists, the Catholic community, the Lutheran community, the Jewish community, the ACLU, and others. And they made a case to the state, legis the state legislators that to resettle refugees in, the South, in South Carolina is an issue of religious liberty. And it was just enough of an argument to give Republican lawmakers who were stuck in the middle on this. They were stuck in like a really tough political debate with their base, but they also realized that you know, a large part of the conservative part of South Carolina also wanted to make sure that refugees res were resettled. In fact, one of the, the churches I interviewed for the book was you know, leadership of First Baptist uh, uh, Church in Spartanburg, one of the largest Southern Baptist churches. And their leadership talked about the excitement of the congregation to resettle Syrian refugees regardless of religion. Um, so that, that ca the case that the coalition made to state legislators managed to bottle up the legislation and died. Um, so my point here is that as we move into an era that is going to be more and more about how states are reacting, whether it's a state like California or a state like Texas, I think the, the strategies and the ways that we have to understand how these issues are playing out on the local level take a different level of, kind of a new level of imagination. It's not about changing demographics. It's not even necessarily about the economic needs of, of that particular locality. It is a really a deep-seated cultural question that so many communities across the country are struggling with. And the challenge is for policymakers to understand that cultural change, that cultural debate, and be able to put forward a constructive policy solution. Thanks. So Michael, at some level, what we're hearing about is a state's rights dream, right? Um, you know, you have states doing what they want to do, and, and Ali has just, you know, really described the sort of that you can encompass in many ways the whole immigration debate within the contemporary Republican Party. Um, you've had the fun of watching this come and go at the federal level several times. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you'd... For my many sins. <laughs> Three different times going back uh, yeah, 27 so years. Yeah. Reflect for us on what the future holds at the, at the federal level. Okay, well, first of all, Heather, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here, and I really love your space. It's a terrific place to hold events. Um, hopefully, we'll be worthy of this wonderful space. Um, I have a lot of thoughts here. Let me try to disentangle them. First of all, one thing I will mention, um, both Adam and, and Ali said this separately in different ways, the, the way uh, immigration now, the foreign-born populations are spread out beyond the initial kind of six or so states to much more of, uh, of America. <clears throat> it's something you notice when you've worked on these things on Capitol Hill. And I'm a House of Representatives person. And um, one thing I can tell you is that when I worked on this, I think it was the 1990 bill um, for a member on the uh, House Judiciary Committee, there were very few members who felt immediately impacted, it's sort of like a you know, an urban member not being directly affected by uh, a farm bill or something like that, even though they do deal with food stamps, but, but on the commodity programs and all that, they check out, they defer to somebody whose judgment they trust who has a lot of that going on in their state. Uh, back then, immigration was kind of like that, and, and there was an outsized influence played by delegations from Chicago and New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Florida because of obvious concentrations of immigrant populations back then in those in those states, in northern in New Jersey also, for example. 
Um, more recently, as you've seen these debates unfold, especially the one in 2013, um, almost every member will, in meetings, put their hand up and give you an anecdote about why this issue is important to them, what happened in a recent town hall meeting, the uh, editorial pages in their uh, home district uh, newspapers and other kinds of magazines and so on in their, in their districts and television stations. It's, it's an immediate issue now for the vast majority of House members, and that makes a difference in how these issues move through the, the system, uh, especially in the House. I think every senator probably feels directly impacted as well, whereas 25, 30 years ago, I think the number would have been much, much smaller. So that has, a, has an impact. Um, another thing I'll just mention, when we get to the logjam aspect of this, <clears throat> I've had this naughty thought a few times, but it is naughty, that um, there's two reasons I've noticed why you can read a law and it makes absolutely no sense to you. Like you just realize what was going on, what was in the water, what was in the air when it was being drafted. And I've concluded there's two main explanations for absolute inanity in legislation. One is the, the, the members who are drafting are trying to meet some CBO score. The Congressional Budget Office has a you know, scoring on what the revenue impact is or what the spending impact is and the people pull, pushing the bill need to get the numbers in align, alignment somehow or other and they end up doing all kinds of uh, legislative contortions to get the next score to actually comport with whatever the political mandate is. The other reason, more relevant here, is jurisdiction. And so a lot of times you find the committee chairman of one committee doesn't want any jot or tittle of their bill to spill over into some other committee's jurisdiction. So you get all kinds of you know, craftsmanship to double and triple check with parliamentarians so you make sure that the only one committee has jurisdiction. So hence, a logical maybe fix to some problem that would transfer to several committees' jurisdiction gets overlooked or gets know knowingly uh, abandoned because the committee chair wants to keep the bill within one jurisdiction. So the naughty thought as we go forward, as you think about areas where um, immigration does, if you want to do a comprehensive bill, the kind of areas that would be implicated, um, a lot of them could, can very easily be thought of as being part of the committee jurisdictions elsewhere. So for example, wouldn't a farm worker type program, whatever that would look like, naturally reside with the Ag Committee? Or would the high tech type area of dealing with H-1Bs and other kinds of high tech or or high skilled workers, STEM and all that, reside maybe in labor, maybe with um, even financial services or other, other committees that I'm thinking of in the, in the House. And so the naughty thought is maybe one of the ways out of this, and the premise here is that if you think of the traditional Venn diagrams, there's a lot of space in the immigration uh, policy area where there's a lot of agreement. But, but there's a, there's a, a veto point uh, that each party has erected that prevents the commonality areas from moving forward because it would have to be part of a broader bill that would also trigger some kind of uh, provisions and solution that would make the Democratic side of the aisle happy on dealing with the 11 million issues and all the issues related to that. And on the Republican side, it would be mostly issues relating to internal security and enforcement of laws and that sort of thing that have been a, a roadblock. The wall is a symbol of that, but there's a lot of other uh, secondary and tertiary elements of that whole whole debate, or the whole aspect of what DHS would do to enforce uh, enforce a law. So those end up becoming the blockages to any kind of broader solution. And the naughty thought is maybe breaking this out into smaller component parts to hitch a ride on other must-pass bills is something to be given some some thought to, because in that case, um, you might be able to segregate out elements that that really are a problem. Uh, that have not been addressed in decades that could be addressed se uh, serially in other, other big standalone bills. Um, the core of all this, of course, and the reason we're talking a lot about federalism, is that it's a broken system. I think one thing that every member of Congress can agree on is that there's no one out there saying, you know, I've taken a look at this legislative or this uh, statutory area, and I love it. This is really well done. It makes a lot of sense. All the moving parts fit together perfectly. It's serving the interests of our country very well. No one says that. So, you, and, and this has been the case for decades now. So you, you have this ongoing tension building up and the system's trying to respond to it, like a market test. And the market test now is coming uh, with states doing things and the executive branch and courts getting involved. 
the last President Obama really did have this sense of, well, if Congress is not going to act, we're going to act. And you had the different, you know, DACA type regulatory, um, you know, executive, not orders, but executive memos coming out <clears throat> from DHS that were trying to address things that the President wanted Congress to address and that somehow they couldn't, because they were logjam, couldn't do. So again, w when you go to Federalist Route, I guess the final point I'll leave you with, and um, it's not the most cheery assessment here, is it, except for that naughty thought, I suppose, is that you want the, um, you want the resolution of this to try to, um, to, to bring people to the table for a number of reasons. And one quick thought on that, you mentioned the licensing issue. Well, that's a real current, favorite issue among conservatives uh, who, who think that state and local level licensing requirements are a real burden to entry level uh, entrepreneurs getting in and doing things. Every, you know, the, the classic is the beautician requirements in a lot of states. You need like 7,000 hours of training to braid hair and you don't really need that. You may need it if it's using chemicals and all that, but you don't need that much for, for a lot of people to enter into a, a, a paying profession like that. And so if, maybe you could bring the conservatives to the table to reform and improve and deregulate the kind of licensing b uh, bars. And maybe the Democrats see that and say, okay, we'll hit your ride on that bill, but we want to make the, uh, the, non, the undocumented or the non-citizen population eligible for this as well. And you find a confluence of, of interest and some things like that. So if you go to federalism route, be creative in thinking how you can bring together uh, both sides, maybe for entirely different reasons to solve one of these kind of problems make life better uh, for the folks who are involved. And I'll, I'll stop there and look forward to your, your questions. So one of the things I hear each of you saying in a different way is actually something, Ali, that you said explicitly, that the solution here isn't political. And in nowhere in any of your remarks did I hear, and then so-and-so lost an election. Um, and that you know, because of course the, one of the ways that our system is supposed to resolve log jams mm -hmm. is that the public is supposed to get tired of the log jam and change who represents them. Um, and so Jude, I wonder if we could start with you and then just anyone else who wants to jump in. Were there any electoral consequences? You know, you, you alluded to how Arizona is always supposed to be right on the edge of turning into a blue state and yet never quite does. Well, I think it's, there, there are some key moments that do come to mind. So um, State Senator Russell Pierce, who I mentioned, is no longer a state senator. So he's, he's the one who, who brought SB 1070 um, a, a, and who is responsible for a, a whole, I, pretty much most of Arizona's immigration legislation. Um, so he was, he was actually recalled and, um, and lost his seat. Um, uh, so that, that was, there was a real kind of consequence, and actually Ali details that in his book. Um, and so I defer to him on more details. Um, but that was before I got to Arizona. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, Sheriff Joe Arpaio did lose his election this last time after winning successively six times in a row. So based, and much of his popularity was because of immigration enforcement you could argue that this last time voters punished him for one of the main reasons seemed to be that um, a racial profiling lawsuit against him had cost, and his disobedience in that suit had cost taxpayers um, tens of millions of dollars. And so that seems to be one of the leading narratives of, of, of why he lost. But I mean, it, they're, they're, you know, and he was also 84 and it was his, um, and there was a lot more money in that race on the opposition side than there had ever been before. So there are many factors, but, but those were some two, two big ones that come to mind. And I guess even before that, though, I mean, there, there definitely is a pattern of, of um, I mean, I think Jan Brewer, uh, who, who was a, kind of an immigration hawk, you know, she, she passed, she signed SB 1070 and then um, was, was elected governor, so she had been interim and or had been appointed, and then she won her election after that. So, so I mean, there there is definitely um, both sides, <laughs> examples on both sides. I would say, um, well, I mean, first of all, the the Arizona um, example, I think, is a is a linkage between the question of kind of politics and culture. So, Russell Pierce, um, when he was running for during the recall race, uh, he, he it was he, what I think in what he thought was an off the record or closed door conversation. He was caught on tape um, and it was reported in the news that 
where he said, in essence, the LDS Church supports SB 1070. The LDS Church uh, was one of the primary players in Utah later in 2010 to sign, uh, to move forward with the Utah Compact. The Utah Compact was a effort by conservative faith, law enforcement, business leaders in Utah to craft five principles that more or less said there's a different way to have this dialogue in Utah. And as a result, they changed the politics in Utah and, and stopped SB 1070 from moving into to the state. But what really kind of got under their skin is when Pierce said the church supports the, you know, the principles of, of SB 1070. So a couple days later, if not the, in the same story, I think, the church released a statement that said, uh, you know, to paraphrase, don't quote me on this, uh, to par you know, that from the church's perspective, we care about you know, family, security, and prosperity. Uh, um, and we believe in a comprehensive solution. So they never explicitly said, Russell Pierce is wrong, but they said just enough to make clear to their community that he did not represent their beliefs. And it's also important to note here that Mesa, in the Senate, or the district that he represented, had some of the highest number, of more, one of the highest numbers of Mormon voters in the state of Arizona. Um, also, you know, Mormon, um, Mormons who do the, the uh, missions overseas are, come back and they tend to be very, very uh, favorably disposed toward immigration and flows of people and they, um, my friends, and just anecdotally, um, <coughs> who are very conservative on everything you, you can imagine, their conservatism channels through a, a love of immigration. Yeah. It, it's very yeah. obvious to me. Uh, and, but then in terms of the other election piece, I, I mean, I think, you know, Donald Trump won the Republican primary to a large degree because of his immigration position. He tapped into an anxiety and fear among the American, work, American workers and their families that, you know, that got him through the nomination. Um, practically every other uh, uh, competitor, every other Republican running for the, that nomination was more, much more moderate on this question. Um, so I think that the... If you had asked that question a year ago, I think I, I would have been challenged to find a candidate for officer or a policymaker who lost because of a pro-immigration position. I think things are just different now. Also, um, there are some members who won, who came into prominence politically because of uh, kind of an anti-immigrant position. One that comes to mind is there was Lou Barletta of Pennsylvania, I believe it was a mayor in, I forget which town in Central, H Hazleton, yeah. And that was his jumping off the springboard to becoming a House member. So, and Mike, do you see that staying that way for the foreseeable future? You know, what's the thing that causes the resurgence of the pro-immigration Republican at the federal level? Since you've just talked so eloquently about how they absolutely exist in the citizenry. Mm -hmm. Well, don't forget you do have the broader uh, discussion where immigration may be an element of it, but it's a much broader one of, of the sorting of the American population into like-minded uh, communities. And I see that um, in the way cr uh, political campaigns play out, especially the, my first love, of course, is just the House. I don't, know, I don't know why, I just love studying it and trying to understand it. And you, you, don't, you see these, these uh, polarized uh, caucuses, both very heavily right of center, very heavily left of center, and very few in the middle, in part coming through because of that sorting. And it plays out what, some places on maybe an energy cluster of issues or some social issues or uh, some broader economic uh, concerns. And immigration is certainly one of those value systems that run through that, that polarized electorate and come out in very, you come out in very, very different places as a result of that. Um, how, you, how you bridge that is kind of what I was trying to get at in my remarks. I, I think you look for ways to pull people together, maybe for entirely different sets of reasons around a, a shared policy. And each side would have to swallow a little bit that they probably don't, don't want, almost by definition. But absent that, it, it's a hard thing to imagine in the near future of a way to, uh, to get the ball moving on a, you know, a solving a problem that's really endemic to the entire area of uh, immigration <laughs> statutory law. Some, some irony to underscore this discussion, the majority of Americans tend to support the immigration reforms, these comprehensive reforms, if asked individually. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the kind of favorability toward immigrants that Americans show, um, Pew Research Center has asked this question every year for 20 years, Gallup, is at historic highs. I mean, in Gallup's last polling, I think it was 2014 and 2015, it was fully 73% of Americans say immigrants are good as opposed to bad for our country. 
uh, numbers that haven't been seen since the early 90s. So there's some disconnect between what the average person believes about immigration and how that translates politically. And I think that some of these points of, that we see in some electoral um, readouts is that those that are more concerned about immigration rank that higher on their list of factors that sway their decision. So where those that are supportive, you know, of course they're supportive, but not voting on that issue. Those who are not supportive are definitely voting on that issue. And I see that happening much more in, in under explaining the divergence now. That's why negative ads work, right? Unfortunately. Yeah, Ali, I was just gonna ask if you how you saw that play out. I mean, in some of the states where you were, did a combination of these interesting welcoming measures and ad some adopting some of the Arizona style measures. So you saw kind of a both and. Yeah, so um, one of the places I spent some time was Indiana. Uh, I uh, interviewed, um, you know, folks from the chamber uh, in uh, Indianapolis. Um, um, got to know some of the folks in the Catholic community. But then the person that I spent a good chunk of time with was uh, Greg Zeller, who is the former Republican Attorney General. He just left office last year, and he told me how. Um, and again, it was kind of this this connection between his political stance as a Republican, good on immigration. Uh, good on refugee issues, but and how that you know conflicted a little bit or a lot sometimes with his position as you know a Southern Hoosier. I keep wanting to say Indiana, uh, um, Hoosier who uh, grew up on the the banks of the Mississippi, um, and he was in office when then Governor Pence made you know signed the letter and made an effort to stop Syrian refugee resettlement to the state of Indiana, and he told me of how he extended the legal case, but then. A day later was at the press conference to welcome Syrian refugees and there as a, as a member of the Catholic Charities Board of Directors. Um, and that plays out, you know, that played out in places like Lake County, Illinois, where, uh, again, a Republican Catholic sheriff who came into office as a Joe Arpaio believer and then now is one of our biggest advocates on immigration reform. Or in Fresno County, kind of the same thing, a very rural area, uh, high Republican, high number of Republicans. Um, but there's just this cultural question of, okay, like you're saying, it may not be a voting issue, but it is an issue of kind of how people want to see their, their communities grow. So Adam, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit since it's, it's not really fair to just ask Mike questions about the Republicans. You know, this, this conversation does sort of assume that the Democratic Party's stance on immigration is written in stone and doesn't change. Um, that's not what you hear people saying all the time. What are we likely to see happen on the Democratic side of the aisle at the federal level as, as this stuckness continues and as we, we continue to have the perception that there's a certain chunk of American voters, um, and frankly, the states that you described are states that Democrats are gonna be very interested in for the foreseeable future. Yeah, um, it's a huge question. I may not be the best person to answer that uh, entirely, but just from a couple observations, I certainly think that the game um, has shifted to, uh, certainly now in the short term, defense. So trying to defend the wins that prior Democratic administration has gained and to try to make advances at the state and local level um, to both affect kind of immediate policy aims and protect individuals to protect rights, to advance some rights, but also to build, I think, as Ali has pointed out, kind of the political groundswell and awareness that can translate back to federal activity. Uh, in terms of federal legislative priorities right now, I mean, that's, that's kind of anyone's guess. I haven't followed that as closely recently, um, but I think the landscape right now, and, and, and really animated by uh, the executive branch, certainly, and the courts is still playing out. There's not a lot of threads to pull on right now. So speaking of the courts, um, looking back at the Arizona example, it, it certainly would seem that one of the lessons that you would take away from the Arizona example was that you have got to be willing to spend a lot of money on legal fees if you want to go the Arizona route. Um, is that, in fact, a lesson that other, that other states and jurisdictions have taken? I mean, are we going to see an exact replica of the Arizona lawsuits in Texas, and is there reason to believe it won't, it won't play out the same way? I think it's been, I mean, I was kind of interested. I'm not a lawyer, I just play one on TV, so I don't know all this, but um, the state of Texas filed, filed the first lawsuit. You know, they sued Maldef and other, others to more or less try to get a decision out of the courts right out of the gates that the, the, the law was, was constitutional. Now, a small town 
I want to say in the Rio Grande Valley has been, I think, the second lawsuit filed. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, additional lawsuits, but um, I don't think the states have, you know, I don't think Texas, you know, they didn't take Arizona's lessons to, to, to heart. I mean, they're plunging into something that's going to cost a lot of money from a legal perspective. Well, I would just add that some of the, the very same lawyers who were involved in the Arizona litigation are involved in challenging some of Trump's executive actions. So some of them got kind of practiced at the state level for what we're seeing now. And going back to California, so it's not only states that are funding litigation against other entities on policy grounds, but we have states that are funding um, legal supports for their residents, right? So in the LA Times just this week, um, Governor Jerry Brown is, is proposing in this year's budget to add an additional $15 million in legal services support for individuals who may face deportation in California, right? So there's a lot of money going behind kind of litigation at, at, at levels of institutions as well as to protect individuals right now. So this is going to be my last question and then we'll open it up to Q&A, but um, how, how long is this, is this um, sort of multi-speed, multi-variant federalism sustainable? You know, Mike, you, you mentioned, and Adam, you also mentioned it's been 26 years, no, 21 years, um, since we've had federal immigration reform, I think um, many of us who worked in government over those years would, would have said this wouldn't be sustainable for as long as it has been. I don't know whether we have in the past seen another issue where um, the status of a human being differs so widely from, from state to state. And so one is tempted to say, oh, this isn't sustainable, something will have to be done. But you'd have lost a lot of bets on that over the last 20 years. So I wonder if, if each of you would like to offer some thoughts on that. I'll start. We can go down the line. Um, you know, as, as a policy-minded person who's tended to kind of be federally focused, I mean, I, I want resolve of the issue. And the issue really is federal, right? And it's kind of in, in, in lieu of fixing the federal challenges, you see literal litigation and kind of figurative litigation of the immigration issue, various issues, through almost every other policy arena now. So the result is, you know, if advanced properly, could put pressure to federal resolve. If not, exactly that which you speak of, this kind of multi-tiered citizenship, multiple identity gets hardened. I mean, I was in um, government when um, the president announced the creation of DACA, right? Now, everyone's going to the mat to defend and, and, and calculates as a win that Homeland Security Secretary Kelly is still preserving DACA. You know, DACA was never the fix. DACA is a stopgap, right, until there's actual, real, lasting solutions. Um, but the, the risk is we fall into this environment where I think, writ large, our identities are shifting. The value of citizenship, you know, we think of ourselves less kind of, you know, we're less proudly American, writ large. I mean, we're thinking of ourselves maybe as a Washingtonian or a New Yorker. The, the identities are shifting in ways that make me concerned that this kind of multi-speed, multi-tiered citizenship is actually more durable than I feel it should be. I completely agree with you. I think that um, I think we're in a period of time where it is incredibly hard, if not impossible, to see what life looks like 6, 12, 18 months down the line. Um, I just think that, I, mean, I just started reading Ed Luce's book, um, The Decline of Western Liberalism. And you know what, it's, it's interesting to me because so much of this debate is you know, East versus West. And that is certainly a big part of this and, and kind of how, how other nations are seeing what we as, as the United States have put forward. But um, and I think there's also an element where it's also North versus South, where you have people whose incomes are rising South of the US or South of Europe, but for you know, any of a number of reasons, they are moving North. And that's churning the system uh, in ways that are economic, are cultural, um, that are really, really hard to unpack and say, okay, this is the, you know, this is the strategy. Um, one thing I'd mention, I think, is to the extent that um, the executive branch and the courts act to try to re resolve different uh, pressure points that are in the failed system right now, that might enable status quo to continue. In other words, sometimes you may need the branches to pull back and live within their guardrails, their boundaries, in order to, to force the system to respond to 
a pressing need as opposed to um, being relatively aggressive and maybe outside the box and in interpreting what's in the black letter law or what's judicial precedent in order to get a solution that they want. So the, so the, the uh, results-oriented approach by the other two branches, Articles 2 and 3, um, might have the unintended consequence of enabling the Article 1 branch, Congress, to just sit on its hinds and not act on this for even longer than it has uh, it been uh, inactive thus far. So sometimes, you know, you gotta be careful about that. Because there is a, I think there's a political marketplace that uh, should respond to this at some point, and, and there's gonna have to, you know, but if, but if you constantly put on solves here and there to try to, you know, keep it from hitting a boiling point, then Congress has the, the uh, innate ability to always look to some other issue. Well, I, I won't speak exactly to this point, but I, just as a sort of a parting word on, um, on lessons from Arizona, I would say that, um, that I, I suspect that there, we might be seeing some fatigue on the immigration issue in Arizona, and I, and I don't know if that might change um, if we see different levels of, of unauthorized immigration change. The fact that, that it, illegal border crossing is quite low might have something to do with it, but I think some of the public opinion polling you saw around the election suggested that, that the Arizona um, voter isn't sort of as concerned with immigration and illegal immigration as an issue and, and, and that there's a bipartisan push to do, um, to increase trade and tourism from Mexico and, and that kind of seems to be, um, a lot of the focus on border issues isn't, isn't all negative these days in that state. So I think that, I think you are seeing a shift, I'm not quite sure yet, um, sort of which direction it's going and how sustained it'll be or sort of what are the causes, but it's been interesting to watch. Well, with that unexpected note of optimism, <laughs> um, my colleague Susanna Rodriguez has a microphone, so please put up your hand and she will come around. Um, we can start right there and then we'll go to the gentleman in back and then the woman in black and white. And please tell us who you are and then ask an actual question. Hello, I'm Andres Martinez with um, ASU and, and New America Future Tense. Um, thank you for a great discussion on an, an issue that I have uh, followed avidly and cared deeply about. Um, one thing we didn't get to, it's interesting because um, you all posit, you know, portrayed California and Arizona almost as being you know, different planets. Um, and yet one thing that we didn't get to is the fact that in many ways California committed the original sin I will define original sin as scapegoating immigrants and immigration for um, short-term political gain when we go back to the 90s and Prop 187 and, and Governor Davis. So, <coughs> and I think that's an important antecedent to a lot of what, what you talked about. And I'm curious to hear from you, Jude, and from others, whether you see California as a, a cautionary tale for what Trump is trying to do nationally for what, um, Joe Arpaio and others have done in Arizona that it's going to catch up um, in a sense politically at, and there will be a backlash? Or was the California case for a number of different reasons um, not something that is a leading indicator for what might happen on both sides of this debate for the rest of the country? So yeah, I think that's a really interesting question and, and I'm from California originally and so as soon as I got to Arizona I was interested in this question. I mean, you know, Prop 187 has been credited with turning Arizona blue and being and galvanizing the Latino vote and really shaping a lot of the political dynamic in California today. And um, as an observer in Arizona, there was sort of the, all of this, there's sort of every election cycle questions about will this be the election that the Latino vote turns out um, in big numbers. And, there is a big Latino population. The, the eligible to vote Latino population keeps growing each year, and yet the voter turnout rates still don't equal the turnout rates of, of white voters. And so, you know, I, I heading into this election, you know, I heard a lot of people speculating, you know, with Trump and our pile on the ballot uh, in this November, um, and of course our pile lost and Trump won. Um, you know, there was this question, like, would that be, is this the Prop 187 moment? If, if SB 1070 um, era and earlier eras, you know, didn't drive a big Latino turnout, would this, you know, this election? And I think um, the numbers suggest that 
that you know while there were gains made in the in the uh, in Latino turnout that it, it still has not kind of risen to its potential and certainly hasn't um, has there is no evidence of a backlash that has had I would argue um, but I, I think so I you know I'm I'm curious like what it takes um, so I so I wonder if that model of voting against a threat as seen in California as this really kind of crystal clear galvanizing moment. It doesn't seem to me that it's played out in Arizona, and I don't know if it will, um, and I'm not sure why, but I'll let someone else take a stab. Well, to the point, so the temporal aspect is important, right? So in California, though, um, you didn't see really material changes, I think, for eight, 10, 12 years after, hmm. which, so we're right now entering the 10th year after SB 1070, you have you know, a senior senator recalled, you have Joe Arpaio, so maybe this is the leading edge of a shift, hmm. um, but you know, I think Texas is now the big case to watch because um, Texas, I mean, their legislature meets only every two years, so you get a good handle of a burst of activity right now, and then there's a year to digest. Um, but uh, in Texas, it has been a you know relatively conservative state, but also um, against the marker in terms of immigrant and even unauthorized friendliness um, in ways that made them an outlier even to Arizona for a while. So in that bigger state, much more diverse economy, uh, much more diversity among the immigrant population, um, this particular SB4 was so targeted, such a loud discourse, all of law enforcement against. You had the governor for the first time ever signing the bill Facebook living. First time ever the governor you know, did a live signing and did it to this, right? So it's a really galvanizing moment for supporters and detractors alike. So I think the real, you know, it, is that temporal element shrunk now in Texas or not? That'll be the big thing to watch in my view. I, I, the, I completely uh, agree on the temporal piece. And I mean, at the, in California you had the 1986 Reagan amnesty legislation then 93 was 187, right? 94, so, so uh, some people, told me that 187 was kind of a backlash to 1986. And then, you know, 10 years later, if not more, 20 years, now you see a state of California that is where the Latino community drives politics. But it took an incredible investment of public sector and private sector investment in infrastructure within the community to create that type of groundswell. I think in Arizona, we're still really early uh, in the process. And I think in Texas, the challenge is going to be uh, different because it's a it's a much larger state. It's a it's a state that doesn't have anywhere the, near the organizing capacity within the Latino community. Certainly of California, not even of Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in in Texas we could see even a longer tail between SB four and uh, um, uh, really the emergence of of you know Hispanic political juice. Well, I was going to ask a sort of further cynical question there, you know, back to Mike, your point about how much more we as a society have segregated ourselves than 25 years ago. And the other thing that I wonder about is income inequality and how much more extreme that is in Texas today than it was in California in the 90s. And if you put together um, sort of self-imposed segregation voting restrictions and income inequality, does that make the tail longer and longer and thinner and thinner? It's going to vary by state, but um, I mean, it is a remarkable um, coincidence of political uh, success that the Democrats have when they have constituencies with a lot of really wealthy, well-educated, and a lot of really poor constituents, and not very many who would be in the middle of those, of those distributions. And the Republicans have the exact opposite kind of political success. And you saw that in the election, right? Um, I think Trump got 69% of um, non-college educated white voters, which is not that much different than where Democrats have been with the Hispanic vote. So it's sort of like an identity politics uh, uh, dynamic, but in an unexpected direction. And, and that's, I think, kind of dangerous in a lot of levels, as all of that is, when people vote on, on those lines. Um, and that that's a if anything is a force for, uh, for not coming to a table and not kind of resolve these things because that dynamic seems like it's not getting it any better anytime soon. Um, the gentleman in the back. Hi, thanks so much for this. My name is Diego and I work for CFED and I have a question about the naughty thought. 
Um, so I thought it was very interesting how you talked about you know, de-linking all of these different policies. And to me, the 2010 attempt to pass the DREAM Act was an example of this. You know, let's not worry about a huge comprehensive bill. Let's worry about you know, the most sympathetic group among the 11 million, and it failed to get 60 votes. And I think if you were to see something about um, the H-1B visa, you've had, you, you, you would have people say, well, you know, there are so many problems with the H-1B visa. You'd have the whole, you know, this is just a way for businesses to not hire American workers and pay them less. So I'm wondering, how can we de-link all of these different policy issues without having people say, well, you actually need all three legs of the three-legged stool for it to stand or for people to um, just go against the policy as it stands on its own? Well, that's a good question. I, I think my starting point is that a lot of times you do have a, a logic that says uh, some issue area, that not immigration, but a lot of other ones, that if you combine uh, all the different disparate parts, one, you, you get kind of a, a, a benevolent uh, dynamic or chemistry that results from that, where we're having a multiple set of things in the, in the final product, legislatively speaking, fills your vote rather than disperses and, and diminishes it. I think what we've seen with immigration, however, is that when you try the more comprehensive approach, you get a diminished level of support and you get too many veto points that just can cancel each other out and you get no action whatsoever. So the reason it's naughty is that I've always, when I was working most recently for Kevin McCarthy, I was really struck at the different people coming through who wanted to focus on just one or another element of the overall uh, issue and they seemed befuddled when you explained why the bigger dynamic was at loggerheads. They didn't get that because they would literally say I have crops, you know, apples that are rotting on the, in the trees because I can't find people to do this because of the dynamics that work in that particular part of the labor market and, and so on, just across the board. Um, and that, hence I, I kept thinking, well, wouldn't it make sense to try to, you know, fit these different elements into a broader thing where, um, where there's many more moving parts that become must pass. And if it's must pass, then this is just a smaller element of the whole and maybe that tension, that, that intensity gets lost in the broader um, project of passing a farm bill or a highway bill or uh, a high tech you know, reform bill, whatever. Uh, so th that, that's the thought. And again, I think you're, you may be right that the reason why that may not work in other areas may not work here, but in which case, you know, I you know, hit the nearest bar and just think about this longer. <laughs> it's just, because it's really a conundrum. But there's also, of course, the House Senate dynamic here. I mean, we can't forget in 2013 for comprehensive, we got 68 mm -hmm. votes, so a, a vast bipartisan majority in favor of a comprehensive bill at mm -hmm. that time. That's a good point. I would also just say sometimes, like, the, the legislative debate is pitted against, you know, enforcement on one side and what to do with regards to the undocumented on the other side. And there's a there's an assumption that um, if you, for the undocumented, you say people get legal status with no citizenship, all of a sudden, you know, we're all good. Um, that may or may not have been the case. I don't think, I certainly don't think it's the case right now. I think that the debate has gotten so, uh, um, the issues of trade and immigration have become so conflated where the assumption, you know, I think the biggest sticking point at this point and I, I would even argue in the la even th 2013 and 14 is future flow. What's the future of legal immigration to the U.S.? Um, and that's you know realized whether it's through a farm worker, you know, mm -hmm. farm worker bills, high tech, or any other thing else. I just think that that's the tension that um, has been our undoing, and you know it's 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 a question harder to un un answer right now given the economic anxieties that the very real economic anxieties people are feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, the woman in black and white. Um, Anna Postel from the Center for Global Development. Um, one idea that we've been really interested in um, and sort of squares with these state federal ideas you've been talking about and also as sort of a smaller component of the larger issue is um, Senator Johnson's recent bill um, to let states sort of adjudicate quotas on temporary workers. I just haven't heard that many people talk about it, so I'm curious if you guys have any um, perspective on the potential for a bill like that or any potential stumbling blocks and then maybe other innovative ideas you've heard to um, move forward in this climate. 
Thanks. I'm so glad you brought that up because there's actually an interesting um, paper out today from the Niskanen Center reviewing all of the state level mm -hmm. efforts to do um, to do employment related immigration, which really is, is a fascinating moment of you know sort of as a federalist, you think to yourself, wait, there's no way a state can do that, but. There have been really interesting experiments, which I'm hoping you all can talk about. Adam, can you pick on you first? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll start with that. So, I mean, the fact that our federal government exclusively decides is not consistent across our peers. Um, Canada has elements of provincial selection, has employer selection, as does Australia, for example. Um, and there's been states, I mean, so not even just from the federal level, I mean, I think of Republican Governor Snyder in Michigan, who has advocated for uh, resettling and devoting more refugees and other classes of immigrants to be resettled to Michigan um, because they want the redevelopment, they want the talent, I mean, for it, in Detroit particularly. Um, so I think that there's a lot of merit to kind of question, you know, does this type of system work as we see in not just immigration but so many policy areas a, a kind of trend of experimentation across the states. Um, maybe this could be one. I don't see why not. Can you talk about the Massachusetts um, higher education example, which is, and maybe, Ali, since you come out of Massachusetts, you can both talk about that one a little bit? This is the, the H-1B? Yeah. Um, so this is um, an effort, um, and actually I'm not sure where it stands. I, I was familiar with it a couple years ago where there was some impetus from the state, from the then Governor Deval Patrick, I believe, um, to create kind of a, an incubator model to attract um, and sponsor through uh, Massachusetts State Universities using state funds H-1Bs. Um, and some of the beauty of working through some of these higher education institutions is you're not subject to caps, right? So allowing individuals to be kind of embedded to a, a public institution, but then also to start or grow a business and have connections in the private sector with incentives to stay in Massachusetts was kind of this hybrid model. And I'm curious if it's still around or what's It's still around. I know Governor Baker, when he first came in, he uh, uh, paused it, but I think he put it back online. I don't know where it is in terms of implementation, though. I mean, according to this, this Niskanen paper that I was reading in prep for this, it is still around. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that on the one hand, this is a fascinating, really innovative model. But, um, Mike and Jude, I wonder if, if to some extent, actually those kinds of innovative fixes on the legal side in some ways add to the anxiety that Ali was talking about earlier about what the future flow looks like and so that this in a way gets back to your, gets back to the wickedness of the problem. Well, on the flow issue as it exists today, um, one thing we did at my office at Hoover a couple months ago, we have an economist who focuses on immigration, so he invited the head of the uh, statistical part of DHS that follows uh, all, all the immigration stuff, really exciting event. Um, but one thing I took away from it was I had not appreciated the extent to which the chain migration side was about two-thirds of the flow. The flow was a million and fifty thousand in 2015 and 650 some odd thousand of that were uh, chain migration. So I think, you know, one of the, my premises is that you'd like to see the system work to the economic and, and humanitarian traditions of a country um, and not, it's almost like having a two-thirds of your flow have, you have no control over. It's almost like you know the parents giving the keys to the teenagers for a weekend, and they invite two kids over for a party, and all of a sudden 300 are showing up, right? Because of the, the, one of wonders of the internet and tweeting and everything. Um, if you you can't, you have to have some control over it. And one way to do it are ideas to substitute for for some of the mig chain migration ideas like what you described that Johnson <laughs> and I think it's uh, Buck have in the House, but also. Um, be reminded that uh, no one really ever talks about this. When Mike Pence was a House member, he got himself into quite a bit of a, <coughs> of a hot, um, hot water over some ideas he had about making that kind of approach with an employer base of side. That if an employer had a need for employees and they went recruiting and found employees they wanted to, to bring into America, they could do that and, and they had certain kind, of, I think what he called it a red card or something like that, a gold card where um, you could come in for a certain, like a contractual period, and it was, it was binding and it could last and be renewed and so on with certain touching back issues or whatever. But he really got in trouble for trying it. But you can do it employer-based, you can do it state-based. The, the caveat I would offer, though, is that if you do it state-based and a person loses their job, what happens to them? I, I think it has, to, it has to be some ability to have a more fluid labor market um, once the person comes in here because of the nat nature of 
uh, job flows co going, coming and going. I don't think you want the person's time here to be simply, you know, they can only be in Indiana or Michigan. You, you want them to be able, if, if, the, if their job doesn't work out or if a better opportunity comes across the transom, to be able to switch to go to Nebraska or Florida or wherever. Um, I think what I can just add to that is just that um, a, a big part of the Arizona story that I didn't mention is that there were very active employer groups that formed sort of in light of all of the state enforcement policy. And so, um, and, and then with the, the various levels in, of enforcement, you know, were either worried that their work sites would be raided, not that they would necessarily face penalties, but just the having all of your employees be arrested one day is very damaging to your business. So a lot of them were terrified of getting raided, you know, even though there, the laws wouldn't have really implicated them personally, but it would have been bad for business. And so you saw, um, some of these, um, even uh, pretty conservative Republican businessmen get uh, pretty enthusiastic about comprehensive immigration reform, be willing to sort of sign on to and lobby for, for a bigger piece of legislation that they didn't uh, necessarily agree with most of what was in it, but because they felt like um, they wanted to see something happen on the federal level because they didn't see what was happening in Arizona as sustainable for business. So that was sort of a part of the piece. Did I see the gentleman in the turquoise shirt had a question? Yep. Yeah, right there in the second row. Um, my name is Michelle, and my question is: there seems to be uh, kind of just a juxtaposition between, uh, like, the rise of uh, nationalism and the polarization of politics, especially at the national level and identity politics. Yet there's so much. It seems like there's so much success in efforts, like locally with churches and local institutions to uh, uh, like welcome immigrants in. So I mean, uh, is that prevalent? Is it pertinent to what's happening? And could it be used somehow to advance the cause? Ali, I think you planted that question. <laughs> um, so the fastest growth in you know, most of your faith communities is coming from you know, Latinos, you know, the, the evangelical community, the Catholic community, the Mormon community, et cetera. Um, so with that growth, you know, if, you know, I say this with all due respect and affection, you know, every pastor is a politician, right? They see a new family in their congregation, and they're going to ask the question, what can, I, what, 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 what can I do to help? And now more than ever, that Hispanic family is going to ask for help on immigration, whether it's you know, something as simple as learning English to helping somebody get legal status. Um, so pastors in really conservative parts of the country are grappling with those questions. And they're answering those questions not just through their faith, but also you know, what's the role of their institution in their broader community. Um, and I, I mean, we're just finding that you know, across the country that's happening. And while it's easy for us to, to kind of be focused, and it's important for us to be focused on the big political debate and the rise of, of nationalism, I think not far underneath that um, are, is a really active conversation. Uh, and to, to kind of go back to the DACA program, you know, DACA was important in that it protected 750,000 young people from deportation. I would argue that it was just as or even more important for millions and millions and millions of Americans to now realize that the family one pew over a church is undocumented. Their kid's best friend is undocumented. The family down the road, street, is undocumented. So it's personalizing this issue in ways that we've never seen. Um, and what it means is that, you know, in Indiana, people love the Jose they know, but they're still afraid of the Jose they don't know, or the Muhammad they don't know, or, you know, whoever it is. Um, and we have to be able to, you know, bridge that gap. Yeah, and this, I mean, we were actually talking about this before the event, is something that we've seen um, across other issues where the, and actually the, the don't ask, don't tell comparison is, is really an interesting one. And, and you know about this from a past life as well, that what it takes to change somebody's mind is knowing someone in that personal way that Ali just described, that sort of vague awareness that, oh, so-and-so is a member of X group doesn't help. The way it was once described to me is that you have to know someone in the group well enough to ask them a personal or embarrassing question. Um, which, you know, in many ways describes church membership. One, of, one of the, the studies I cited, uh, <laughs> one of the studies I cited uh, was a, a s analysis of the Gallup survey last summer. And, uh, you know, the Gallup survey is what, a sample of 90,000, so it's a massive sample. 
And what they found is that your, your Trump voter at that point in time lived in a culturally isolated community. So that was certainly one factor. But the other factor, in fact, a stronger factor behind their vote was that they felt their child would not do better than them. Um, so yes, the personal relationship is important, but that personal relationship is not going to happen for everybody. And it may actually be uh, overshadowed by a deeper economic anxiety. Great. Um, for the last, uh, we have two more questions over here. So maybe we could take you two together. And if each of you ask your question, then we'll give the panel the, sort of the last, last word. Hi, I'm Emma Thai. I'm with the Cybersecurity Initiative here in New America. I really appreciated all the context you guys injected into this conversation, and I'd like to ask you to do it explicitly. So what, uh, recognizing that these debates happen in shifting context, what is one specific bit of context or trend, whether international, technological, political, economic, that you'd like to lift up and connect to this conversation? Thank you. Uh, Richard Fulton, I'm with the American Jewish Committee. Uh, since we're talking about the role of state and local governments, I want to come back to the federalism question. Uh, it, it seems as if, uh, you know, with contending state laws, taking very different diametrically opposed views, some trying to look at more strict and tough enforcement on immigrants and some trying to protect immigrants, uh, the question I have is whether we've, we've got a, an, an irreconcilable contradiction in terms of what's the relationship between the states and the federal government in terms of immigration, and, and does it matter? Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, and, and just recalling that for, for a long time, uh, the discussion about immigration vis-a-vis -vis Arizona or vis-a-vis -vis Indiana's efforts to keep, keep out refugees, the discussion was, this is a federal role. It's the federal government uh, sets immigration policy. States shouldn't be setting their own immigration policy. But now when you have California or Massachusetts, Massachusetts even, you know, trying to set aside what, what some would say is an explicit federal law about sharing information by local authorities with federal officials. You know, how do we reconcile all of this? Does it matter? And where, where are we going to wind up in terms of, you know, the relationship of the federal government and states on immigration enforcement? Great. Context and federalism. We'll give, we'll give each of you a last. Adam, you want to? Sure. I mean, so taking, taking the second question first, I mean, I think this goes back to some of the themes we've touched on a bit. Uh, you know, the different branches, because there hasn't been the federal legislative outlet, we're seeing increased state activity, we're seeing increased court activity, and those branches are really trying to hash it out. Where that's going and how that's sustainable, I, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable and unsettled with it kind of right now, knowing that that's kind of a process of democracy that we should all cherish and share. Um, but I still contend that with certain comprehensive federal solutions, most of the other problems go away. I mean, almost instantaneously, it, with perspective. So I think that there's still hope for some big fixes that can resolve a lot of those underlying issues. Um, not not near-term hope, for sure. Um, and on the broader issue, you know, the, the discussion and how we feel toward immigrants and towards others in this country is not necessarily unique to this country right now. But at the same time that we're having these discussions, um, there are others that are seeking to woo immigrants. And we have benefited, despite our broken system, by being still the most attractive destination for newcomers of all stripes for generations. And I don't think that that's a guarantee given that that will stay so in the next 20, 30 years. And when a Canada, an Australia, a France, a Germany, um, not UK likely right now, um, is actively wooing immigrants in ways that we have abdicated in that leadership role. What does that say about us and, and what does our future economy look like? So I'll say the, the federalism question, um, I'm not sure it matters at this point. I think we have to fight the fight at multiple levels. And that fight is not always defensive. Sometimes if we're on offense. Um, but I th like I said earlier, I think we have to think about the innovative strategies to do that at multiple levels. And how that shakes out, um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I am optimistic in that, you know, I was in Idaho six weeks ago in front of a room of 75 dairymen at 4 p.m. They're grumpy because they'd been up since 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at least half of that room had voted for Donald Trump. But they were, they were afraid of the direction of immigration enforcement because their Latino workforce had not just been with them for over a decade and was part of their operation, but they saw them as an extension of their community and their family. 
So those Idaho Republican conservative dairymen were fighting for refugee resettlement, fighting against immigration enforcement efforts, um, whether it's at the state or the federal level. So that's, that's why I'm optimistic. And I think whether that's context or, or something else, I think that it's up to us who care about these issues to the way we put it is our, you know, we have to you know, meet people where they are, but just not leave them there. Uh, on your question first, um, I don't think it's an accident that <clears throat> the countries that have had a large uh, outpouring of concern and controversy relating to immigration have also had fairly stagnant economic um, cr you know, outcomes the last decade or more. And I suppose I think you know, th th that's at the root of a lot of the uh, kind of concern and antagonism and, and all that on the, on the one hand. Um, to find ways to help un unbridle the growth I think would have a ripple effect positively with respect to how this issue plays out because uh, that can be, immigrants can become an easy uh, target for people whose um, communities are, are suffering, whose jobs are going away or whose incomes are stagnant or going down, uh, whose kids don't have that same prospect of a future as, as they may have had when they were their kid's age. Um, so, so I think getting to the root of a lot of that uh, and getting the economy back up to 3 to 4 percent range of growth rather than 1 to 2 um, could go a very, very long way of creating a political uh, ecosystem in which you could actually get a, a, a legislative solution on, on immigration. Uh, and then on federalism, um, you know, federalism is from a, in a political uh, ethics sense is a very um, situational issue. So federalism recently was uh, considered and rejected on the uh, health care issue when it was put forth to the, you know, to the Senate. They, they're looking at that and, oh, we don't want that. And, and the Democrats in the House didn't want that. But it was purely giving the states a lot more uh, ability to weigh various parts of, uh, of the status quo in the Affordable Care Act and do things more comporting with what di different state governors and legislatures wanted to do. Here, federalism might have a different, might be a different take. But don't forget that we're in an environment now where I think it's 68 or so of the 98 legislative chambers are run by Republicans, and some of them by very large supermajorities of them, and 30, what, three governors are Republican. Um, you know, that, that's the exact upside down of what it was 40 years ago or so. And so, um, y y depending on where the center of gravity is ideologically in those chambers and in those state houses, you may, you, federalism in the immigration realm might lead to, a, like you kind of suggested, a whole bunch of results that some people uh, left of center wouldn't like at all. So you got to be careful <laughs> what you get. You get what you ask for. I think I'm going to take the journalist cop out. I tend to not prescribe or overanalyze outside oh. of my expertise. <laughs> 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 well, then I will close by reminding everybody that if you um, enjoyed this panel, you can, number one, um, look up Ali's book, There Goes the Neighborhood. And you can keep an eye out for Jude's forthcoming book, which doesn't have a title yet, but um, you can tweet suggested titles at her. Um, and or you can follow her reporting in um, Arizona and watch for the book. And uh, join me in thanking this terrific panel. And join the panel for refreshments outside.